The first round of explosions related to the walkie-talkie and pager attack incident occurred in Lebanon's capital, Beirut. This also affects several other areas of the country at around 15.45 local time, which translates to 3.45 p.m. The blasts continued to occur throughout the country for two days. This attack also allegedly targeted mobile phones, laptops, solar energy cells, as well as walkie-talkie radios that were purchased at a similar time, about five months earlier, as the exploding pagers. This is the Icon-branded walkie-talkie, a widely recognized and reliable communication device often used in various industries and by professionals for secure, long-range communication. Let's take a closer look inside this walkie-talkie to better understand its main components. At the front, you'll notice the LCD monitors. Next, we have the microphone, which captures the user's voice and converts sound into electrical signals that can be transmitted. Finally, at the back of the device is the power source typically a lithium-ion battery. To help illustrate how similar technology could be reproposed in dangerous scenarios, let's examine how a bomb works. In essence, constructing a bomb requires four key elements, power source to provide the necessary energy, a triggering mechanism to initiate the detonation, a main explosive charge to cause the destructive force, and a detonator to set off the explosive. Applying this to a hypothetical scenario, the lithium-ion battery could easily serve as the power source in such a device. An explosive charge such as a dynamite or a similar material could be hidden within a seemingly ordinary object, like the top section of a cell phone. In a recent attack, for example, the explosive material used was pentaerythrinyl tetranitrate, or PETN for short. PETN is a highly explosive chemical compound known for its potency, and it belongs to a class of chemicals called nitrate esters, which are often used in explosives due to their reactive nature. A detonator could be placed just beneath the explosive charge to ensure precise timing of the explosion. As for the triggering mechanism, something as inconspicuous as the antenna could be used to receive a signal that initiates the detonation. Once everything is in place, a message or radio signal could be sent to activate the bomb, resulting in an explosion designed to target and eliminate high-value individuals such as commanders and soldiers. Let's take a look into the origins of the walkie-talkie. This is a Japanese-based radio communications and telephone company. Interestingly, the company announced that the production of several models of their ICOM handheld radios was discontinued 10 years ago. So where and how they were counterfeited still remains a mystery. Now moving on to the origins of pagers is a bit trickier. Five months before the explosion, a Hungarian company called BAC Consulting bought the licensing rights from a Taiwanese company named Gold Apollo. Unconfirmed reports suggest that the company shipped the products, and at some point along the supply chain, explosives were planted along the way. The products were then shipped back to Hezbollah. To help you understand better, let's simplify the shipping routes. Hezbollah ordered the pagers from Hungary, but the products were allegedly made in Taiwan or somewhere nearby. Afterward, they were reshipped to Lebanon from Hungary, and that should have been the supply chain. A quick recap and correction with this pager. Inside a typical pager, you'll notice these components working together, particularly the batteries which power the device. Now let's consider a hypothetical scenario. Imagine you're looking at two identical batteries inside the pager. Although this is speculative, if we were part of a spy agency, we might consider disguising one of the two identical batteries for a different purpose. One battery would provide the necessary power for the device, while the other could potentially serve as an explosive cleverly concealed within the pager. To expand on this theory, a lithium-ion battery weighs approximately 23 grams. Interestingly, reports in the news have mentioned that an explosive weighing about 10 to 20 grams was detonated. This similarity in weight lends some plausibility to the idea that a battery could be used as a disguised explosive device. We believe there was a timer for triggering this explosive that can disable or unalive an adult if placed at the correct time since 2,750 were injured, which cannot be a coincidence. Now Israel will launch an airstrike through the south of Lebanon followed up with ground invasion in the following days to come. We all know Hezbollah has been fortifying its area near the border with four layers of defense. The first layer starts here, moving back as the second layer, and the third and fourth layers are positioned here in the back as command and control centers. At the tip of the spear are the tactical defense compartments located strategically along these areas close to the border but spread out to remain as close as possible. 
Interestingly, they will not keep the rocket firing positions close to the tactical defense area to avoid collateral damage. Just behind the rocket compartments is the headquarters responsible for directing and commanding troop movements. And finally, we have the sector headquarters. But this might create a domino effect as Hezbollah, one of the Middle East's largest non-state actors, has been planning its strategy in tactical defense and offensive operations. As we all know, the IDF has well-armored tanks such as the Merkava and the Namr fighting vehicle. However, Hezbollah might use the terrain and climate to Israel's disadvantage in armored and maneuver warfare, as most of these areas are hilly and rocky, unsuitable for tank tactics. Hezbollah's tactics include light infantry, reportedly numbering around 100,000 soldiers and anti-tank weapons like the Tufint, an Iranian anti-tank guided missile reverse engineered from the American BGM-71 tow missile. Additionally, Hezbollah has around 100,000 rockets in its arsenal, though some internal reports suggest they have up to 1 million rockets in stockpile, an immense quantity of weapons. Not to forget the 100s of drones from Iran like this one which can serve as both counter-surveillance while also switching to attacking mode. If an all-out war breaks out, it would drag Iran, which is Hezbollah's biggest sponsor. In the first stage of the attack, it can launch multiple drones of various kinds. An hour later, the UAVs will be probably joined by multiple cruise missiles capable of reaching Israel in just over an hour. Finally, over hundreds of ballistic missiles, which take just between 10 and 15 minutes to arrive, will be launched from Iran. At the same time, drone attacks will be launched by the Houthis in Yemen and Iranian-backed militias in Iraq, while Hezbollah might fire missiles at Israeli positions in the occupied Golan Heights. Let's explain why they are launched at different time intervals, as these drones usually have a speed of around 114 miles per hour, which translates to approximately 185 kilometers per hour. In comparison, a cruise missile has a speed of around 500 miles per hour, which is about 800 kilometers per hour. A ballistic missile, on the other hand, has a speed of around 3,836 miles per hour, translating to approximately 6,174 kilometers per hour. That is exceptionally fast, and as a result, it will catch up swiftly. So in summary, when the drones reach the designated target, the cruise missiles and the ballistic missile will eventually strike their targets at almost the same time. Now Israel allies will respond to this threat by launching fighter jets. While the UK fighter jets probably came from Cyprus along with the Voyager Airbus tanker taking on a few drones from the south, fighter jets from American aircraft carriers might take part in neutralizing these missiles, while the US destroyers tackled a couple of dozens of ballistic missiles. While allied fighter jets could also work together to neutralize drones flying through Jordan and Iraq, as the Allied forces took out a quarter of the drones and missiles, the Israeli defense system kicked into action. Now let's take a look how the Israeli defense system works. The Israeli defense system consists of three tiers. First up is the long-range aero missile defense system, which was designed specifically with Iranian missiles in mind. Each of these system rockets costs a few million dollars, and they can intercept missiles outside the Earth's atmosphere, resulting in enhanced protection. The second layer of defense is the so-called David Sling system, designed for taking out missiles and drones. Finally, the Iron Dome stops most short-range rocket attacks in Israel. We make original 4K 3D animation with a small team of animators, so please support us by subscribing and dropping in a comment for more exclusive engineering animations made just for you guys.